Okay. Anyway, ketamine, we're only using it. And I'll have to tell you, this, you, would, you would have to, like, I'd have, you, I would fight strongly if anybody tried to take this drug away from me. It is clearly used. Almost every hand in this room went up, and I went kicking and screaming into this camp because the first two patients in whom I used it actually were at your place about a million years ago um, and had bad emergence reactions. But they were adults. I didn't know what I was doing, and I've learned a lot about the drug since, as have we collectively learned a lot about the drug since. Project number one is by Al Sacchetti, who's one of our faculty. <clears throat> and he has a thing called the ProSCID, which is a registry for procedural sedation in kids. And it looks at what we do. It just kind of keeps track of sort of what we do and how we do it, et cetera. This is a 1,000 kids, <coughs> excuse me, 1,000 episodes of sedation and 977 kids. And what he found in this particular group is that 41% of, of the kids that got sedation got ketamine. And overall, the sort of side effects, bad effects rate overall of procedural sedation was about 0.6%, and none of them were kids with ketamine. Ketamine is a remarkably safe drug. We'll get into this some more as we get into this sort of half hour together. But it's a really, really safe drug across the board. What he did find in this paper, which is interesting, which kind of goes to the JACO stuff that Rick was referring to yesterday, we all know that JACO has completely come in and run our lives in oh so many ways. But one of them is how we do procedural sedation. And they have major rules and regs and things that we're supposed to be doing with procedural sedation. They've defined the different levels of sedation. They've told us what kind of sort of QI and CME things that we're supposed to be doing to keep up on sedation. Who needs to be trained in sedation? What kind of sort of sign-offs we have to have? And one of the things that they say in the JACO guidelines, which is something that Al points out in this paper, um, is that we're supposed to have an operator, so the person doing whatever the procedure is, be it the laceration you know, repair or the shoulder reduction, and a separate person to be available to manage the airway if necessary. The reality is that doesn't happen. More than three quarters, actually, almost three quarters, of these procedural sedation episodes that occur in the ProSCED registry, it's one doc. Now, I think that for us, that's not an unreasonable standard. I think because we do airways, I think that's completely fine. The point of this, that the reason that JACO did this, is for the, anesthesi not the, the um, GI guys that basically snow somebody to a sat of 75% you know, because then they quit fighting while they scope them from stem to stern, and they are used to putting the tube in the wrong hole. So I don't want them putting a tube down my airway. They're used to putting it down the wrong place. They're not the person to be managing the airway. Well, I think what's interesting about this, and I'm not sure if any of us will ever get cited for this, but the reality is virtually all of us do procedural sedation with a nurse and us, and not another airway person available. And that's just the way it is, and the data here says that's what we do. And I guess it's the reality of it, and I, I, I'm fine with that. You know, I can step away from the shoulder and go right to the head if I need to, if something happens, so it's just fine. Fasting. Do we need to fast prior to ketamine? Oh, by the way, ketamine, just that, one more thing about the, the JACO thing. Um, ketamine does not fall into the categories that JACO has defined. JACO has defined light, um, let me think, light, moderate, let me get this right, light, moderate, and deep sedation. And, deep, and, and the reason that they've defined it is that you, if you inadvertently overshoot, and you meant to, I just meant to take the edge off so I could get this laceration sewn, and oops, I overshot, and now they're not breathing, they're deeply sedated. They wanted this sort of spectrum of definition, so, and they wanted you to be able to manage any inadvertent overshooting of sedation. That was kind of why they did this. They don't throw dissociative sedation into that pot. They actually, you can actually challenge some of the JACO guidelines if you use ketamine by drawing up a completely separate dissociative sedation protocol where you basically say, a lot of this stuff is just thrown out the window when we do dissociative sedation. It's the, it's the chemical pith. The lights are on and nobody's home. I'm breathing, my heart rate is fine, my blood pressure is fine, and I just don't, I'm not connected from here to here. It's a chemical pithing. It's actually remarkable. It's an amazing drug. And so you can kind of get around Jaco a little bit with ketamine by doing a dissociative sedation protocol. Do any of you have those? I know we did. We've drawn up, drawn up a totally separate ketamine protocol. And it's, it flew through Jaco with no problems whatsoever. Now, fasting is an issue. One of the things that the reason Jayco got involved in this is there were some pr pretty significant procedural sedation uh, misadventures, including deaths, that occurred, and that's why Jayco, for patient safety, got involved in this. One of the things our anesthesiology colleagues get their knickers in a twist about is, is fasting. You know, how dare we in the emergency department you know, give somebody sedation who has eaten the Cheetos in the waiting room, which they all do, right? The kids are waiting to get their laceration sewn. They're sitting next to the vending machine. They all come in with the, you know, the orange fingers. They've all been eating. This fasting stuff that's out there, the American Academy of Pediatrics has their own guideline. 
the American Society of Anesthesiologists has their own guideline. And what they recommend for sedation is that six hours of no solids or two hours of no liquids or more. So, I mean, let's get real here. That is just not potentially, that's not something we can do routinely in the emergency department. A couple things about fasting. For us in the emergency department, we need to weigh risk and benefit of any kind of thing we do to anybody, including sedation. And what I usually use as my personal gauge is if I'm doing the sedation right now for my convenience, I, need, I think twice. It's like, okay, is it really that can If the patient just had a Big Mac and supersized fries and a you know, humongous Coke, and their shoulder is out, but they're otherwise fine, I'm going to wait a little while before I sedate them. I'm not going to do it. I'm doing it for my, for my convenience, not for theirs. However, if somebody has an emergent thing that needs to be done, a big, nasty, goopy lack that I need to really irrigate out and clean up and really work on, I may do that. Or they have neurovascular compromise. I'm absolutely going to do it right now. I have to weigh the risks and benefits. That applies to the fasting protocol. It is interesting, though, if you look at what, why do we even have this fasting thing as a concern? It's not meant for procedural sedation. It's meant for anesthesia. And if you look at when aspiration is a problem in anesthesia, it's in two situations. One is after inhalational anesthetics, which we don't use. It's what our anesthesia, anesthesia colleagues use, and that causes a lot of post-anesthesia vomiting. If you've ever had an inhalational anesthetic, you wake up sick as a dog. You're just sick as a dog. The other thing is most of the um, aspiration concerns happen during airway manipulation. As you're futzing around trying to put a tube down the airway, that's when the aspiration occurs. Well, neither of those situations, we're not inhalational anesthetics, we're not manipulating the airway, neither of those apply in the situation of procedural sedation. And that's actually in the editorial that's abstract number two. Steve Green, who is literally Dr. Ketamine, this man has done most of the major publishing for emergency medicine use of ketamine. He is really an amazing resource on ketamine. Basically says, this, this is silly. This fasting stuff with ketamine, which protects airway sort of reflexes, is silly to have these kind of fasting guidelines. And in fact, the best evidence medicine thing, this is actually from Emergency Medicine Journal, Emergency, Emergency Journal, which is um, a British publication. They basically say that fasting, there's no proof that fasting makes any difference. Prolonged fasting with ketamine sedation in children is unnecessary. They did this by looking at the literature, looking at the evidence, and it is unnecessary. And actually, what's interesting about fasting is shown in abstract number three. Abstract number three looked at using IV, to IV ketamine, looking at vomiting in kids aged 1 to 12 years of age. Took a decent number of kids, 257 of them. And what they found to cut to the chase is little kids don't vomit. Period. Little kids, don't, little kids with ketamine don't vomit. The older kids do. Kids over the, up to the age of about 12. 6 to 12, they were the ones that tended to vomit about half the time. And the longer you fasted, the more likely you were to vomit. Completely counter to what we think. And I'll, t I'll tell you, what's, what is scarier? Um, somebody who's just eaten Cheetos and now vomits and aspirates. Or somebody who hasn't eaten for three hours, so they vomit and aspirate Cheetos. Or if somebody who hasn't eaten for three hours and vomits and aspirates five cc's of stomach acid. Which is worse? The stomach acid, flat out, by far, is worse. Which is why a lot of pre-op people get, get um, PPIs or H2 blockers to take care of the acid. And it's the acid that's the problem. It's not the Cheetos. The Cheetos may grow bugs later sitting down there, but they're not going to cause a lot of local difficulty. The acid does. So this basically says the longer you fast, the more likely you are to throw up. And the older the kid, the more likely you are to throw up with ketamine anyway. So ketamine, actually, honestly, the fasting thing is really not that important when it comes to ketamine at all. And these best evidence topics reports basically say it's not. Now, how about using atropine? Why do we use atropine with ketamine? Do you guys use it routinely? We have it as part of our protocol, but that's being addressed. Why do you use it? Saliva. Saliva. Ketamine causes hypersalivation. It absolutely does. Okay, it does. You've all seen it. If you haven't given atropine as a routine thing, you've seen, seen this. It doesn't make a difference to give the atropine. That is of a huge debate right now in the literature. There's another one of these best evidence topic reports in this thing. This particular publication did a lot of ketamine uh, reviews. And actually, abstract number four is the only good paper that looks at IM ketamine in highish high doses, four per kilo, and looks at what giving atropine in conjunction did with that. Okay, what do you get for that? They basically took 83 kids, randomized control trial. Half got it, half didn't. So they all got ketamine, half got atropine, half didn't get atropine. What they found is that hypersalivation was definitely reduced, from a third of kids salivating to only about one in 10 salivating. 
And what they found more importantly wasn't the salivation so much, but it also reduced vomiting. The theory being that when you have all that saliva in your mouth, it triggers the vomiting reflex and it makes you throw up. It triggers the gag reflex and makes you throw up. It's the only paper, though, that's done well looking at a randomized controlled trial of atropine or no atropine in kids. There aren't a lot of other great trials. And what's fascinating is there aren't great trials with IV ketamine which is what a lot of, uh, there's tons of history of use of IV ketamine out there. Not a lot of data. It is being challenged in adults flat out. Can you use ketamine in adults? Yeah, a lot of potential downsides, but yes, you can use it. If you use atropine in an adult, however, you know that they may bump their heart rate. That's somebody with bad heart disease. That may not be a great idea. So you know that we give atropine to bump people's heart rates. We know it keep, keeps them dry, but it also bumps their heart rates. That may not be a good idea in adults. And kids, it's probably safe, but right now, I know of two other papers being sort of reviewed out there that are looking at whether you should be using it routinely. And the reality is you may not have to. You may not have to use atropine routinely in kids. A little downside in adults may be a problem. Now, how about midazolam? Should you be using midazolam routinely? And what's, why do we use it? Why do we use midazolam at all with atropine? What's the problem, or with the ketamine? What's the problem? We're Emergence. Emergence. And if you've ever seen it, it's gnarly. In a, have any, any of you ever had ketamine? I have a friend who got ketamine as a, as a it wasn't social, it was for <laughs> medical reason. He was overseas and it was the drug used. He broke his leg, it was the drug used to do his whole relocation thing, reduction thing. He said it was the most terrifying half hour of his life coming out of ketamine. He said it was terrifying. He didn't have an emergence like, you know, tear the ER apart kind of reaction. He just said everything was scary. Everything was distorted and large and loud and he said it was very, very frightening, very frightening. Kids have less emotional baggage than we do. And I've seen more kids come out of ketamine laughing hysterically at mom's six eyeballs or at the, you know, the monster in the corner of the room thinking it's hilarious. They think it's really fun. They don't have the emotional baggage yet. They've watched fun stuff instead of all the scary things that we've seen. Should, does it work? If we're going to use midazolam to get rid of this, this emergency reaction, does it work? I'll tell you, it really doesn't. It's, there are a couple really good papers. One is in here, actually. Abstract number five looked at giving ketamine IV, okay, this is one mill, milligram per kilogram, with or without midazolam, 0.1 per kilo. 266 kids, good size study, very good size study overall. What they found is the emergence reaction was identical in the group that did or did not get midazolam. It didn't prevent emergence. What it did do is sedate them. And it sedated them to, to a couple of kids to the point of hypoxia. That's a problem. One of the reasons we give ketamine is we don't have to worry about sedation too much. We don't have to worry about respiratory depression too much. Well, you do if you give midazolam in addition. And actually, abstract number six basically says that same thing, that it's the, it is the midazolam sedation at, when you add it to ketamine that causes the respiratory difficulties. Ketamine alone, totally safe respiratory-wise. Across the board, really, really safe drug. What, what has been right, I'll tell you right now, most of the pediatrics groups are completely relooking at the use of, ket of midazolam with ketamine as a routine practice. The drift is to use it only if emergence becomes a problem as the ketamine wears off. It works actually at that point better than it does prophylactically. So we, pr the better practice probably is to use ketamine for sure as a drug, maybe add atropine up front, consider stopping using midazolam up front and only use it if there seems to be an emergence problem as the drug wears off. Give the dose of midazolam at that point and take the edge off at that point. That seems to be the best practice at this point. And the, some of the guidelines are being reworked as we speak to sort of change the recommendation on that. So that's where things stand at the moment. How about the route, IV or IM? Is one better than the other? We actually give it both now. It took us forever to get our anesthesiologists to let us go from IV, because you know, they wanted a line in. I don't know why. Now we're to an IM protocol. By the way, IM, if you decide to give an IM, you can mix, if you do all three drugs, you can mix all three in a single syringe. So it's a one-shot thing. It's not three shots. It's a one-shot deal. You can mix all the drugs in a single syringe. Is one route better than the other for the patient? It's interesting. Abstract number seven is a randomized control trial. 208 kids. This will tell you the power of nursing. They got either IM or IV ketamine in this study. And what they were looking at is how effective was it? That's really what they wanted to know. What's the efficacy of IV versus IM? They found that overall, IM ketamine is more effective, both in pain control and in controlled sedation. It turned out to be better for both in this study. In fact, 80% of the kids had reported no pain at all with the procedure they had done. The reason this study is interesting is the nurses basically went on strike 
and stopped the study. The nurses basically said, we're not doing the study anymore because more kids vomited with IM ketamine by about a three-fold margin, a no, two-fold margin. It was 18% in the IV group, 35% in the, in the IM group, and the length of stay was 40 minutes longer in the IM group versus the IV group. And the nurses said, we're done. We're not doing this anymore. They're barfing in their hair for another 40 minutes, so we're done. We're not doing this study. You do have some downside to IM ketamine. You do have more vomiting. You do have a little bit more prolonged sedation. Um, the, it is a better drug overall as far as the patient's perspective, however, from, from the pain standpoint. So with, honest to goodness, I think either route is totally fine. It's whatever's convenient for you at the time, what you need to do. I do recommend, though, if you have a procedure that may take a while, a complex laceration where you're going to be working for a while, IV is probably better. You can titrate it a little better, keep them at a, at a nice level for you while you're going and doing your procedure. Otherwise, though, if it's just a one-shot deal, you know, doing a wrist or a shoulder or whatever you're doing it for, a single IM dose is probably fine overall. Now, optimal dosing. This is interesting. Abjects 9 and 10, look at this, you know, what optimal dosing is there. This is the how low can you go deal. They look at doses of things like 4 per kilo um, IM down to 2 per kilo IM. Um, I'll tell you, this isn't much ado about nothing. I'm not sure the low, how low can you go is the concern here. You don't get less side effects by going by a lower dose. You get a little bit less duration by going with a lower dose, but you drop your efficacy a little bit as well. So I think the, the doses that have been well tested, which are one per kilo IV and four per kilo IM, are probably the best doses to stick with. We know you get adequate sedation across the board with those two doses. The duration is pretty predictable, about a half hour IV, about 50 minutes IM, to getting back to being able to kind of walk around um, overall. So I think, honestly, IM, IV, just stick with the regular doses and don't, don't futz with this, how low can you go? We'll talk about how high can you go in a second. Can you give it orally? I mean, kids, the scariest thing to a kid in a hospital is a needle. I mean, it just freaks, it freaks them out. Just coming, I mean, they're standing at the door like this, not wanting to come in because you have needles. You walk in with a white coat on, they flip out because of needles. It'd be nice if we could give it orally. Wouldn't it? It'd be great if we could give ketamine orally. There's one study in the database that looks at that. It's abstract number 11. And it was given in this, do in this particular study as a pre-anesthetic agent before going to the operating room. It was given at a little dose there, you'll see, you can see, but its efficacy was fine for taking the edge off. The kid was kind of cool and calm, but not dissociated. We need a kid dissociated. Okay, for what we need to do, we need the true sedative aspect of this, not the take the edge off aspect of this. And no one has studied what the oral dose would need to be for our level of sedation we need for what we need to do. So right now, there's no good data at all on whether we could use this orally, so we're still stuck with needles as far as ketamine is concerned, yeah. You can you, actually, there, but there are very few studies. Yes, you can inhale it. Um, but there aren't any studies that have looked at dosing for efficacy. But, but if it is one of those things to consider, if like, oh my god, I have nothing else, and this kid is freaking out, or considering it even in asthma, which we'll talk about in a second, using it in asthma. Therapeutic window. So Rick sort of stole, stole my thunder on this one. Ketamine comes in three formulations. Go back to your hospital and see what you stock. Stock one. Don't stock more than one. It comes in 10, per C, 10 milligrams per cc, 50, and 100 milligrams per cc. So you can see how easy it would be to grab the 100 per cc bottle and have the nurse come up to you and say, you know that 10 per kilo you ordered, or that 10 milligrams you ordered in that cute kid in bed too? I gave 100. Did it? Yeah, from the same formulation issue? Was that the, what happened? I'll tell you, it's scary. Although, compare that little to, doctor, you know that one of Dilaudid you ordered in bed one? I gave 10. <laughs> well, that's, I'll tell you what happens. Basically nothing except sleeping a long time. You do get prolonged sedation. This, God bless them, Steve Green in abstract number 12 pu published basically therapeutic misadventures, 18 of them total. Um, one kid got, got up to 100 times the intended dose. Not 10 times, 100 times. How do you give? How do you give 100 times? That's a, that's a gram of ketamine. Who would give a gram of ketamine? Oh my God. But anyway, all of these kids did just fine. Okay, two had respiratory depression and needed some temporary assistance, but not, it was more like shake them and have them breathe. It wasn't even bag them. 
and they sleep a long time. But you don't end up with blood pressure problems. You don't end up with, you know, it, they do okay. They do fine. What happened with your kid, the one that you had happen? What happened? Uh, he stayed in the ICU overnight, and uh, actually did end up going to sleep because he uh, had a uh, uh, limb disability. Oh. So he had a limb disability before. Charming. But now someone's paying for his future. Uh, oh, the county, uh, the county of Cook in Chicago. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, when there is a therapeutic misadventure, and we'll talk about medical errors is the, my second talk today, and what we're supposed to be doing about these sorts of errors. Fortunately, most of the time this is safe, but you still have the issues that come up with that. Oh, was he really? Oh, and he still didn't save you? <laughs> oh, bummer. All right, critical care procedures. Can you use ketamine for that? Yes. Abstracts 13, 14, and 15 basically say, especially in the unit, it's very helpful for us in the ER. We use it all the time, so it's like that's no big, no big news to us. Can you give it to adults? The reality is yes. When we got our ketamine protocol at Harbor, this is now like 15 years ago, about a year into it, the orthopedists discovered it, which is your worst nightmare, right? <laughs> they discover the ketamine protocol. The curtain gets pulled. The nurse disappears with them behind the curtain. They go do their thing, so, you know, there's, and there's no screaming. It is nice. Usually you know where the orthopedist is in the ER because you hear the blood-curdling screams from behind the curtain as they're doing whatever they're doing to some poorly you know, anesthetized person. Well, they love this, but they would do their thing, and then they would just leave. And then the, the adult would come out of it and flip out. They, wouldn't, they didn't know how to dose it right. They did, all they did was snow the heck out of the patient, and then the person would come out of it with emergence problems. It was a nightmare, absolute nightmare. Can you use it? Yes, but no, the following. It does, in and of itself, raise blood pressure. It does, in and of itself, increase heart rate. That's part of the catechol release that goes with ketamine. It absolutely does that. Knowing that, know that there are certain patients in whom you should be hesitant to use this drug. Vasculopaths, cerebropaths, people with bad heart disease, bad hypertension, think twice about using this drug. And we have lots of sedative drugs out there. We've got propofol, we've got atomidate, we've got lots of sedative drugs. This may not be the best one for every adult. And I'll tell you, any adult who's a little funny or has any sort of psych history, I would not give this to. Those are the ones that come out. That, my first ketamine use was in an adult, mid-50s-year-old guy about 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Gave it to, did my thing. I can't remember what the procedure was. But I left the room while the nurse was kind of standing in the doorway. I left the room, and about 15 seconds later, I heard this crash in the room. Like, oh my God, I went back to the room and what he had done is he'd taken, he'd gotten off his gurney, taken his gurney, took it on its side and he was crouched behind it saying, he was back in Vietnam, Charlie, it's Charlie, he totally flipped out. This guy thought he was back in the ditches in Vietnam. It was completely, it took forever, we had to call security, and I don't know if Rick knows entirely the story, it was at his joint, I probably should be quiet, but it was really quite, quite the event, I learned a lot about adults, so be careful, can you use it? Yes, you can. Very little data. Even though this is internationally the most commonly used general anesthetic across the board, it's used, there's not a lot of data published, very little data on using it in adults for sedation. You can use it, no, it's downside. Can you use it in asthma? How many of you use it as your induction agent if you intubate an asthmatic? You know what's, have, have you had any, let me tell you, tell me your experiences. I had, to, I, it has changed my practice, this drug, as far as asthma is concerned. My experience has been the following. I've used it four times now in asthmatics. Um, we don't intubate asthmatics very often anymore. We just hit them like crazy. If you need to intubate them, though, you do, and they're usually sick as a dog if you're to that point. The asthma, it's terrifying <coughs> asthma. You can't make it them better. My experience has been the following. With two of the four people in whom I've used this as an induction agent at basically one per kilo doses, as an induction agent is what I've, how, what I've used in this, I've literally gotten all my stuff ready, telling the nurse, well, go ahead and give the ketamine. I'll be, you know, I'm getting all my stuff ready. And I go to intubate, get the, get the sucks pushed on the patient, and they're looking real good, actually. They're looking real good, good enough that two of the four didn't get intubated. I think what you get with ketamine, and there's actually a protocol in certain provinces in Canada. Have any Canadians use this? Because I know there's a protocol out um, sort of on the East Coast where they actually give a half per kilo of a, of a dose of ketamine as part of their initial treatment of, of the bad asthmatic. What it does is it does a mild dissociation, so they're not fighting, you know, that awful fighting, anxious thing that goes with, with suffocating from asthma. And it is an inherent bronchodilator. So you get a little of the extra boost of the drug, and you get a little bit of the sedation properties, the dissociative. I'm not, I, don't, I don't care anymore that I'm suffocating to death because I've dissociated myself here. I just don't care. 
And there's actually no good data published on this, but a lot of anecdotal evidence that it can, e that can sometimes prevent intubation. You do get the drug benefit from using it as the induction agent, and there is definitely evidence that if you put them on a drip, especially kids, you put them on a drip, there's a dosing schedule in there for you. But if you put them on a drip, you may be able to get them off the vent sooner. Kind of cool. Kind of nice. And we've actually gone now to our uh, intensivists at Harbor. We're starting to use an um, IV protocol in the ER to try to get them off the tube as soon as possible. Barotrauma is a huge problem in asthmatics. And you really would like to not have them intubated at all. And if you intubate them, you'd like them off the vent as early as possible. Now, there is a pilot study in there on kids. Um, it's abstract number 18 that does bring out some of the problems with the drug. This one is, was 10 kids that were getting basically a ketamine infusion for bad asthma. They did find that it did good things for their asthma, but they also found that three of the 10 kids couldn't tolerate the drug. It either caused agitation, flushing, um, hypertension. A couple of kids got really hypertensive. So if you use this drug, don't use it with impunity. Watch the blood pressure closely, monitor them closely and see how they do, but know that this is definitely a thing to throw in your armamentarium. Then the last little bit I want to mention in here is ketamine is a drug of abuse. Um, if you live anywhere near an urban center, you are seeing this. Okay? You just may not know you're seeing this. Ketamine has absolutely become a drug. There's all kinds of street names for it. The kick, the K vitamin K, it's called all kinds of stuff. It is definitely a drug of abuse. And what they come in with is um, usually trauma. To be perfectly honest with them, what they usually come in with is trauma. Ketamine is a great anesthetic agent. It's a great analgesic. So they often come in traumatized. They've been driving, they crash a car, but they don't manifest pain the same way you'd expect them to because they have ketamine on board. So they can have a bone sticking out and they don't feel it. They just don't feel it. Know that this is out there. They tend to be agitated. Um, hypertensive goes with it. If they've used a lot of it, they can get hyperthermic. Um, know that this is out there. It's a tough thing to pick up. It's not on any drug screen. Okay? It does not test positive on any drug screen, so don't expect it to test positive. So overall with ketamine, stick with your usual doses, 1 IV, 4 IM. Atropine, probably a good idea, but not necessary all the time. Ke um, midazolam, I would only recommend at this point on emergence reactions themselves. Fasting, probably not necessary to do with ketamine overall. Probably okay in adults with the right caveats used and considered as your induction agent in asthma. I think it's a great drug in asthma. All right, any questions on ketamine? It's a great drug. It's really quite fabulous. Yeah, John. Actually, that was just written up in one of those throwaway um, emergency medicine journals about, about literally priming the pump, telling them how fabulous it's going to be. And, and, and you're right, asking them what they like. Are they going to be a princess? Do they want to be in a garden? You know, what do they want? It's, it, it makes a big difference. I don't think it works with grown-ups, but I think it works with kids. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that whole talking people through things is a remarkable thing anyway. Um, I had a grandmother, an abuela, talk her granddaughter, her eight-year-old granddaughter, through an entire LP, took her through a garden. I was listening to her in Spanish. She was walking her through a garden, and this little girl never budged. I don't think she even knew I was there. It was amazing. Yeah. Uh, what I found in this particular case was a severe, severe dog bite. So the child picked up and was shaken by a dog. Oh. Oh, really? What more to get more to get him down? It's interesting because that, that's um, in the procedural, like particularly in burn units, they use it a lot in burn units, and that's not brought up in their literature. Although I don't, I don't know if there was 
uh, the thing about ketamine is it's a pretty decent analgesic, um, but it isn't a perfect analgesic. And I wonder if there's a pain uh, memory that happens with some of these repetitive kids, like the burn kids or this kid. Because it, it's a pretty decent analgesic, but it's not perfect. Are you next?